Welcome back. In this video, I'll be talking about the best films I watched in 2021. Despite what you may think if you watch my worst of list, link in the description, I really do love movies and I watched some amazing films this year. I strongly recommend checking out any of the films on this list and hopefully you can catch a few. Before we get started, please consider liking and subscribing. You can now also join my channel and become a member to receive exclusive updates, get your name in the credits of my videos, and an exclusive badge next to your name whenever you leave a comment, at the low low price of $1 a month. Let's get into my honorable mentions. Dune. I have mixed feelings about Dune. I think the performances are superb, and Villeneuve is quickly becoming one of my favorite science fiction directors with his work on Blade Runner and Arrival. But this film feels incomplete without its second half. I'll see how I feel about this one in 2023, The Suicide Squad. The Suicide Squad is the best superhero film of the year. James Gunn flexes his creative muscles and makes obscure comic book characters like the Ratcatcher and Polka Dot Man endearing and entertaining. There are a few jokes that don't land, but the film's fast pace makes sure they don't linger for long. Luca. I went into Luca with very low expectations, but this film's depiction of a gorgeous small Italian town and the fish people that call it home won me over. I think that Pixar could strive with similar light-hearted, low-stakes dramas, which makes me excited for Turning Red, as it seems to be in the same vein as Luca. Tick Tick Boom Andrew Garfield has had a great year with Spider-Man No Way Home and Tick Tick Boom. Garfield does an excellent job playing Jonathan Larson, the creator of Rent, in an adaptation of the titular autobiographical musical. Since Garfield can sing, I hope they cast him in the eventual Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark movie. Wham! A24 is known for curating and distributing some of the best independent films of all time, especially some excellent horror films. Unfortunately, Wham! isn't much of a horror film at all, despite the marketing surrounding it. Wham! is instead a quaint and quiet methodical drama. I found the film highly enjoyable, despite its horrible beginning and ending. Now let's get into the list. Number 10. The Matrix Revelations The Matrix Revelations is a reboot that subverts the typical reboot formula. In this new Matrix, Thomas Anderson, played once again by Wholesome 100 Keanu Reeves, is a successful yet mentally troubled game developer. Neo used his paranoid delusions to create a trilogy of video games that the audience will recognize as the first three films. The simulation begins to break around him when his co-worker, who's Agent Smith in disguise, tasks him with creating a sequel game to the original Matrix series. The film takes many shots at modern franchise filmmaking and the safe corporate filmmaking prevalent nowadays. The film has been interpreted to be a response to the meteoric success of Spider-Man No Way Home, but I think there's a film that's a closer parallel, Free Guy. YouTuber Jeremy Johns recently compared the film Free Guy to Matrix 4 in his Best of the Year video, infamously calling Free Guy a better Matrix Resurrections than The Matrix Resurrections. The comparison between these films was not lost on me either, but I feel the opposite way. The Matrix Resurrections is a challenging film, but most importantly, it's unflinchingly original. The Wachowskis craft incredibly unique cinematic experiences, for better or for worse, but they always have something to say, which is why The Matrix Resurrections made my top 10 list this year. Number 9. Street Gang – How We Got to Sesame Street I find it hard to critique documentaries but Street Gang was the best one I watched all year. The HBO Max documentary tells the story of Sesame Street's creation and how it progressed throughout the years, culminating in Jim Henson's untimely passing. Sesame Street is the most important children's program of all time, and this documentary shows how an unlikely team of individuals came together and changed the world for the better. The film talks about some of the unsung heroes of Sesame Street's production, while Henson and Oz are credited with the show's success, and rightfully so, as the Muppets have always been the main draw for the series, they weren't the only ones who worked on it. The three main subjects the documentary focuses on are TV executive Joan Clooney, director John Stone, and composer Joe Raposo. Before watching the documentary, I knew nothing about these individuals, but their contributions to the program were immeasurable. The documentary tells the whole story through incredible interviews and a plethora of archival behind-the-scenes footage. The most impressive interviewee they were able to film was the now late Carol Spinney, who worked on the show for 49 years as the puppeteer behind Big Bird and Oscar the Grouch. 
Overall, Street Gang is a great retrospective look at one of the most iconic kids' programs of all time, and the people who made it a reality. Number 8. The Power of the Dog The Power of the Dog is a gripping western and another film that looks like a New Zealand tourism ad. The film, based on the novel of the same name, focuses on the relationship between two veteran cowboy brothers, played by Benedict Cumberbatch and Jesse Plemons. Cumberbatch is a very set in his ways macho cowboy, while Plemons is more tolerant to others. Plemons decides to settle down with a widow, played by Kirsten Dunst, and her teenage son, played by Cody Smith McPhee, to start a family, which draws the ire of his brother. The film mainly focuses on Cumberbatch's hostility towards his new sister-in-law and nephew, as he views Dunst as a gold digger and McPhee to be unmanly. The most powerful scenes of the film are when Cumberbatch and McPhee share the screen. There's a great sense of unease and the film uses their dynamic to examine what masculinity is and how Cumberbatch's character might be repressing his sexuality. The film demands your full attention, as nobody's exactly who they appear to be at first. I recommend re-watching the film after you finish it. As you can see the little breadcrumbs the script sets up that reveal some of the characters' true intentions. The subtlety and nuance each character is written with make The Power of the Dog one of the best films of the year. Number 7. The Hand of God The Hand of God is an autobiographical drama by acclaimed Italian director Paolo Sorrentino. Sorrentino recounts his teenage years through weaving a beautiful yet tragic coming-of-age story. The film is separated into two very distinct parts. The first half of the film is very vibrant and lighthearted, but almost exactly halfway through the movie, Sorrentino depicts how he tragically lost both of his parents, and the film becomes darker and colder. The best comparison I can think of is that this movie feels like the song Nights by Frank Ocean. Halfway through the song, there's an iconic beat switch that recontextualizes the entire song and gives it a bipolar nature. Throughout the entire film, there's some absolutely beautiful cinematography, Sorrentino does an excellent job at recreating the Italy of his teenage years through a beautiful nostalgic lens. The film is a very dreamlike quality. A lot of the characters feel intentionally flat, and there are a few surreal fictionalized moments. It feels like time has distorted Sorrentino's memories of when he was 16, and we're seeing his interpretation of why things played out the way they did. The film was great, except for one scene that made me uncomfortable. Number 6. Spencer Spencer is a fictionalized version of the British royal family's 1991 Christmas celebration through the eyes of the late Diana, Princess of Wales. Diana is played by Kristen Stewart of Twilight fame, and she loses herself in the role. Spencer's greatest achievement is how it perfectly portrays the popular princess through Stewart's perfect performance and the moving picture's precise script. Spencer digs into Diana's psyche and how the weight of being a member of the royal family was driving her insane. The film does a good job of portraying the isolation Diana was feeling, as she was completely alone, except for her sons and the staff of the estate who are sympathetic to her plight. The film uses some interesting recurring motifs, like dead pheasants, and the story of Anne Boleyn to convey how hopeless Diana felt in her constricting marriage with Prince Charles. I feel I have to give a trigger warning for this film, as it does have a very graphic, yet not distasteful depiction of Diana's eating disorder. If that's something that might bother you, I would recommend you skip this one. I always appreciate some great royal family slander, so Spencer was a great film. Number 5. Titan This is probably the hardest movie to sell on the list. Titan is a French foreign film about a serial killer stripper who's impregnated by a car who has to pretend to be a missing 17-year-old boy to evade the authorities. I checked this one out as it won the Palme d'Or at Cannes, and was nominated by France for the 94th Oscars in the foreign film category. Unsurprisingly, considering the explicit content of the film, it did not make the shortlist. This is my favorite foreign film of the year, as it represents an incredibly unique look at the concepts of gender and sexuality that I have yet to see anywhere else on screen. Despite this film being part of the body horror genre, I found it incredibly heartwarming and enjoyed the chemistry between the two leads. Agatha Roussel and Vincent Linden have excellent on-screen chemistry and what's probably the most awkward parent-child relationship ever. I don't want to spoil anything about the movie, so go check it out. It's number 5 on my list. That must mean something, right? Number 4. Come on, come on. Joaquin Phoenix might be the most talented actor alive right now, and Come on, come on is his best performance to date. 
Come On, Come On is a drama about a documentary filmmaker who's tasked with looking after his young nephew as his father's having a mental health crisis. The film heavily relies on the performances of Phoenix and his child actor co-star Woody Norman. Norman gives a perfect performance in this film despite being only 11 years old. He's one of the best child actors I've ever seen and I think he'll continue to do great things. Phoenix and Norman's performances are perfectly suited to handle the complex and difficult themes the film works with. Come On Come On touches on the issues of abortion, climate change, death, dementia, gentrification, natural disasters, and mental illness through the eyes of the youth. This is achieved by the intertwining of interviews from Phoenix's documentary and excerpts from different children's books with the fictional lives of our protagonists. The story teaches its audience an important lesson about how we can learn quite a lot by interacting with people from different backgrounds. Norman challenges Phoenix to be more creative and to be more understanding of the people around him, while Phoenix helps Norman express his creativity and helps him healthily process his difficult feelings. The film's main message is that it's okay to not feel okay sometimes, because the world is hard, and I think that's something everyone needs to hear and take to heart. Number 3. The Green Knight David Lowry's interpretation of The Green Knight is one of the most beautiful films I've ever seen. The film is an adaptation of the tale of Gawain, the nephew of King Arthur, and his honorable quest to meet the Green Knight so that he can chop off his head. Gawain's journey can be interpreted as a metaphor for being a loser man-child in his 20s that refuses to leave the house to get a job. The design of the titular Green Knight is top-notch. The prosthetics put on Ralph Innocent combined with his haunting voice create a creepy yet intriguing antagonist. All the other characters have beautiful costuming too, my personal favorites being Gawain with his heroic orange cloak and Arthur with his intricate crown and cloak which is embellished with design metal plates. My only complaint is that there's some distractingly bad CGI, which can take away from the breathtaking cinematography. The best parts of the film are the beginning and ending of Gawain's quest that bookend the film. The opening, when Gawain plays the Green Knight's game, is incredibly tense, and the fake-out ending is masterfully done. The Green Knight has been stuck in the back of my mind ever since I watched it for the first time back in July, and I can confidently say it was one of the best films of 2021. Number 2. The French Dispatch if I had to pick my favorite film I saw in theaters this past year, it would be The French Dispatch. Wes Anderson's unique aesthetic is on full display in this anthological film that plays out like an issue of The New Yorker. The film is divided into five chapters, each one narrated by a different member of the star-studded ensemble cast. All the Wes Anderson regulars are here. Adrian Brody, Bill Murray, and Owen Wilson give their typical quirky performances, alongside new additions to the Anderson verse like Timothy Chalamet, Benicio Del Toro, and Jeffrey Wright amongst many others. The film's anthological approach worked perfectly, allowing each cast member to have their moment to shine. I found myself getting fully invested in the stories our fictional reporters told, and after each chapter ended, I kept on being surprised about how much more the film had to offer. Wes Anderson is incredibly talented at creating immersive fictional worlds, and the French Dispatch is no exception. The film has some of the most beautiful set design, costuming, and cinematography I think I've ever seen. Every detail, including when the film shows scenes in color or in black and white, feels deliberate. The French Dispatch is an instant classic. I cannot wait to rewatch this film again and again. Go check this one out if you haven't already. Number 1. Inside When people think of 2021, there's not a more definitive work than Bo Burnham's Inside. Bo Burnham's fourth comedy special is a voyeuristic look at his psyche during the 2020 lockdown. Bo had previously sworn off creating comedy specials because he was having panic attacks while performing, instead choosing to focus on his film career. In early 2020, he had built up the confidence to go out on tour again, but then the pandemic hit and derailed his plans. His desire to create a new special drove Burnham to isolate himself in his home with a camera and his music production equipment. After months of hard work, we got inside. The do-it-yourself approach Burnham took gives inside an incredibly unique and intimate feel. Burnham is an incredibly talented director and he can create stunning visuals despite his self-imposed restrictions. Burnham's stellar cinematography is accompanied by a diverse and catchy pop soundtrack. I don't have much else to say about inside. To me, it's something that transcends being a movie and is more of an experience. Bo perfectly captured the current cultural zeitgeist and made jokes about all of our collective anxieties. 
Inside is a perfect work of art and my favorite film of the year. Let's hope 2022 is another great year for films. Until next time.